Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming to the Korea Society. Um, this almost seems unnecessary, but I'll do it anyway, <laughs> introducing Victor Cha. Um, so he is uh, a senior advisor and holder of the inaugural Korea chair at CSIS. Um, he is also director of Asian Studies and holds the DS Song KF chair in the Department of Government um, and School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Uh, from 2004 to 2007, um, Victor served as Director for Asian Affairs at the White House on the National Security Council, where he was responsible primarily for Japan, the Korean Peninsula, Australia and New Zealand, and uh, Pacific, Island, Pacific Island Nation Affairs. Dr. Cha was also the Deputy Head of um, Delegations for the United States at the Six Party Talks in Beijing, and he received two outstanding service commendations during his tenure at the NSC. Um, Dr. Cha is also a two-time Fulbright Scholar. Um, he holds Georgetown University's Dean's Teaching Award for 2010, very good, <laughs> and the Distinguished uh, Research Award uh, in 2011. His book, Before Power Play, is titled The Impossible State, North Korea, Past and Future. And last but not least, um, Victor Cha uh, started his career as an intern at the Korea Society when he was <laughs> at Columbia University. That's right. Okay, okay thanks everybody. That is right. <laughs> thanks, Tom. And I'm Steve Norper, uh, Direct Policy Programs here. I uh, am delighted to welcome Victor. Not only did he start as an intern with the Korea Society, he actually started as a Yankees fan. <laughs> and I know I have a Mets fan in the front row, but uh, uh, he grew up uh, uptown and uh, is a supporter of the pinstripes, and so we're very much looking forward to next season, uh, though I'm also a Cubs fan as well, so yeah. this season is proving to be pretty well. I've gone well. Um, so welcome. Uh, great to have you back, Victor. Uh, nice to see you here again. Uh, you were last uh, formally with us for a policy program at the beginning of the year in terms of forecasting. Uh, and uh, sat alongside uh, Ralph Cossa and Scott Snyder, uh, two of our very good friends, and uh, lent us some very keen observations. Um, and your book today uh, and its release, I think, actually dovetails very nicely because you alerted us to a, a great deal of uh, what you thought would be happening over the years and what has happened. Uh, and in the interim, a few things we didn't discuss have happened, uh, such as... Uh, the problem with the Philippines and a direct challenge to its alliance uh, with America. Uh, and your book now has uh, been out a short time, has uh, received very nice reviews, including a very nice October 5th write-up in the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on that. Uh, and it's a very different book uh, from your prior book, uh, The Impossible State, which we'll get into maybe in a bit. But I was wondering if you'd like to open with some thoughts about power play, where it sits, uh, and why it interests our readers here in studio, those viewing online and sure. those listening by a podcast. Sure, sure. Um, well, uh, thanks, Steve and Tom, for having me back. The Korea Society, it's always a pleasure to be back here. Um, the um, So this book actually took, I don't know, uh, 13 years to write. Um, it was something that I had started um, in 2003, and... Uh, I had written about 125 pages, and then I left Georgetown to work in the government. And so um, I didn't work on it for three years. And then when I came back to Georgetown, I wrote two other books, the book on politics and sport, um, and then The Impossible State, until I finally got back to this book. So I'm very happy to have it, to see it and have it done. Um, and it's, it's, it's special to me uh, for two, uh, for a number of reasons, but I'll just highlight two of them um, this afternoon. One of them is that it's um, um, it's a book that uh, I have uh, sort of dedicated to my colleagues in academia, my mentors. Uh, but it's also a book that was inspired by one of my students, right? And it was actually not a very good student. It was a student who. Um, showed up late, habitually showed up late to class. And uh, um, I was uh, giving a lecture about the difference between Asia and Europe in terms of the way security is organized. You know, in Asia you have NATO, in Europe, Europe I'm sorry, in Asia you have the hub and spoke system, the bilateral alliance system, in Europe you have NATO, sort of this 
umbrella um, organization. And when I say hub and spokes, I'm assuming people, you know, the idea is think of a bicycle wheel where you have a hub, that's the United States, and then you have these spokes emanating, radiating from the hub, which are the individual alliances that the United States created in Asia. That's how you get the term hub and spoke. So, um, um, and so I was taking the class through all the different reasons that we think, you know, uh, Europe has a NATO and Asia has the hub and spokes system. And I talked about geography, right? Um, Europe it was a contiguous land theater with a clear dividing line in the middle. It was easier to create a single umbrella organization uh, in Asia. Asia was uh, maritime and um, land. So it's, it's a more complicated theater. I talked about um, polarity, right? Great power polarity, the, the notion that in Europe, it was a bipolar system, right? The United States and the Soviet Union. Asia, you also had a bipolar system, but it was complicated by a third pole, and that was China, right? Talked about economic interdependence. There's more economic interdependence in Europe after World War II than there is in Asia. Talked about a number of things, and then, um, uh, the student, you know, who walked in late, like um, for our, uh, for class. Um, I think um, this particular class, he noticed that I noticed that he was late. And so at the end of class, you know, it's a class of about seventy students. He kind of shuffles up to the front and says, "Professor Cha, I have a question. Um, can you tell me why the United States chose to build a bilateral security system in Asia?" and my initial reaction was, I just spent half the lecture talking about mm. this. And so I went through it again, and he was like, oh, okay, thanks, thanks. And then he kind of shuffled off, probably to go back to bed or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then as I was walking back to my office, I, you know, I was thinking, I always think about the questions that students ask, and I was thinking about it, and then I, I thought that it's actually a very good question, whether he intended it to be or not, because it was dealing with the question of why the United States made choices, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, I, I talked about structural reasons why Europe is organized differently. But he was asking why did the United States, you know, there are structural reasons and there are choices that you mm -hmm. make. So why did the United States make these choices? And so that's what got me interested in doing this. Like, mm -hmm. I wanted to try to understand, you know, wh what, what was Harry Truman, George Kennan, John Foster Dulles, mm -hmm. Dwight Eisenhower, what were they thinking at this time? Um, a very formative time. You know, this was the end of World War II, the end of the Japanese Empire, decolonization, Cold War. Everything was in flux. And strategically, the United States had, it was really a blank slate. You really did not have a strategic template for Asia. Um, and so th to me, it was a very important period. So I wanted to look at it. So you're right, it's not like, my other books, and that my other books about sort of about things that are happening now, they're about policy. This is much more a historical book. I spent a mm. lot of time in the archives. I spent a lot of time at Princeton. At the, I mean, the book ended up being published by Princeton, but um, a lot, a lot uh, time looking at the Dulles Papers. Yeah, where this Princeton. photo comes from? Right, and so this photo actually comes from um, the uh, the Dulles collection at Princeton, um, and this is a photo of John Foster Dulles at the front in Korea. Um, in I think it's June twentieth, nineteen fifty. So it's actually less than a week before mm -hmm. the North Korean invasion, um, and uh, that's a defense minister who's in the middle there. And I, I don't remember the names of the. It's a Just Mad K commander that's that's uh, pointing out something to him there. So mm -hmm. so that's that's how I got into starting to do the research for the book. And, so. and, and interestingly, and you point out. And, and maybe you can explain a bit more for us. The Korean War really looms large, both for itself relative to China, and, and then really too as a counterbalance to fears about Soviet aggression mm -hmm. in the European theater and, and potentially the absorption of what of Berlin and, and yeah. Yeah. Germany in that case. Yeah. I think I mean what especially for a, an audience that is just in Korea. I think what people really don't appreciate, which I try to draw out in the book, is how um, the Korean War fundamentally changed the way the United States thought about Asia. Um, um, in chapter two, I sort of go back a little bit in the history of U.S. engagement in Asia, and for the most part, it's pretty safe to say there were three things that you could say about U.S. engagement in Asia. The first was that 
um, it was largely commercial, you know, open access for trade. Uh, the second was there was a strong missionary component, right, missionaries in Asia, um, uh, unlike the British who did not send missionaries to Asia. Um, um, and then the third was that it was, uh, it was not strategic. Right? The United States did not have a strategic interest in Asia. Uh, and to the extent that one existed after the end of the Second World War, it was largely maritime. Right? The United States is a maritime power in Asia. Um, we're not a continental power. Mm -hmm. um, and when George Kennan got the okay from Dean Acheson to start thinking about strategy in Asia, he said, we are a maritime power in Asia. The most important country in that respect is Japan. Japan is the only major power in Asia that's a maritime power. And we should not be on the Korean Peninsula, and we should not be in Taiwan, Formosa at the time. We should just, and this led to the famous defense perimeter speech, right, that Dean Acheson drew a line, um, showing that U.S. interests did not include Korea and Taiwan. Um, it's only after the Korean War with the North Korean invasion, uh, that, that things change. That we, the concept of the domino theory becomes a real um, strategic belief uh, on the part of the United States. The idea that if one of these small countries fall, they could all start tipping like dominoes. And um, uh, you know, when, when the Chinese Communist Party won the revolution in 1949, we were not thinking domino theory then. Mm -hmm. um, it's only after the armored invasion on the Korean Peninsula that we start thinking about domino theory. And so I talk about it in the book, up until this, um, 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 by, I mean, it took a, it was, there was a long process for the United States to try to figure out what its strategy was in Asia, in part because we were completely focused on Europe. I mean, we thought there was going to be a war in Europe, for certain. So we're completely focused on that, and only um, so you think about Europe all day long, and at the end of the day, you'd be like, "Okay, what about Asia?" And um, um, so, uh, singly focused on your, and so to the extent Asia pol policy strategy evolved in January, February, nineteen fifty, it was as I described it. You know, mm -hmm. maritime oriented, um, you know, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Philippines, maybe, maybe Indonesia. Not at all anything on the continent. January, February of 1950, right? Within four or five months, by June of 1950, everything changes. Right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the Korean War had a huge, huge amount to do with that. Yeah. And the power play aspect of it also brings into uh, question and relevant to that, uh, for better lack of a word, the containment. Of, of one's allies as well, a, a sort of a check. And in the terms of the Korean Peninsula, a Sigmund Rhee and concerns that there might be a launch forward against the North Koreans because of dissatisfaction about where uh, the situation stood mm -hmm. uh, within the senior levels of the Korean administration at the time. Uh, and concern about uh, putting uh, Taiwanese soldiers potentially in on the Korean Peninsula and then drawing China further in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so could you maybe flush out for us a bit about this idea of, of power play and, and how it's evolved over yeah. time and why it's relevant now? Yeah. Um, so the, um, so if, we, if we pick up the story from um, um, uh, the beginning of the uh, Cold right? so the beginning of the Cold War, um, so the United States knew it needed anti-communist allies in Asia, right? And so um, you had Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan, you had Tsung Man Rhee in Korea. They were both vehemently anti-communist, right? So check that box, anti-communist, good. Um, but there was a problem. The problem was they were strongly anti-communist, but they were both domestically not really legitimate. Uh, and they were both, they both had revisionist agendas in the sense that both of them were embroiled in their own civil wars. So they wanted to be a U.S. partner in the Cold War, but they also had their own, they were embroiled in their own civil wars and they had their own agendas, right? In the case of Chiang Kai-shek, you know, he clearly wanted to start a war with the mainland. And in the case of Sung Man Rhee, he wanted to take over the Korean Peninsula, right? It was pretty clear in both cases. And both of them did things that really uh, raised concerns in the United States that 
They were actively trying to draw the United States into a nuclear war with China. Um, so that's, you know, that was the dilemma they faced. On the one hand, they needed these allies. On the other, they didn't want to write them a blank check where they could do something that could, you know, pull the United States into a war when the primary focus was Europe, right? Our primary focus at the time was Europe. There was another problem, um, and the problem was after the North Koreans invaded uh, South Korea, as I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, the domino theory emerged as the predominant strategic belief. Right, that if one of these small countries fell, they would all start tipping. And so that was the problem. On the one hand, you needed these countries. On the other, you could not, um, uh, you, you could not distance yourself from them if they did things that might entrap you into um, a larger war in Asia. So this was a real dilemma for John Foster Dulles, for Truman, for Atchison, for uh, Kennan. And in the end, I think what they did was they chose to exercise what I call the power play, which is to establish deep bilateral ties, deep bilateral alliance relationships with each of these countries to foster a level of unprecedented political and economic and military dependence, and then use that to be able to both defend but also control these allies so that they would not do anything to pull the United States into a nuclear war with China. Um, and so uh, I go through the book in painstaking fashion, you know, examples of how the United States used this power play, how it would, anytime Chiang Kai-shek or Sung Man Rhee looked like they were going in a bad direction, the United States would use, leverage the relationship that it had established to bring them back into line. Right. Um, and the point is, is that this was much more efficient and easier to do in terms of setting up bilateral relationships than it was trying to convene in a multilateral grouping. If you have a multilateral grouping and we're all discussing things by committee, it's going to be much harder to exercise that sort of influence. So, <clears throat> so in many ways, the choice was because of both a concern about the domino theory, uh, the need for allies, but also concerns that some of these allies might go rogue. Mm -hmm. on them, and, and, and that's how we ended up with uh, this bilateral system. Now, of course, those sorts of concerns are not as relevant today. I mean, the United States is not worried necessarily that South Korea is going to uh, pull the United States into a war or that Taiwan's going to try to retake the mainland. Um, and so in that sense, um, that sort of dynamic is not there anymore. But the, but the bi this bilateral alliance system left s has left such a deep imprint on mm -hmm. the region. It is to this day still the most significant um, part of the architecture of Asia today mm -hmm. uh, and um, also helps to explain why um, regional architecture developed relatively late in Asia. Mm -hmm. right. So to take your book then and kind of cast it out into 2016, um, this week we've had a meeting between the United States and South Korea in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. with consultation between the foreign uh, and, and defense uh, minister and the secretary of state and mm -hmm. secretary of defense. Uh, that says a great deal about the state of the U.S.-Korea alliance and the concerns that we face relative to North Korea. Uh, it is a time when this book sits against the rise of China uh, in very interesting ways. and. Uh, if we want to add to that, you have uh, Duterte in the Philippines directly challenging some of what has gone into this. Uh, and you have uh, uh, Russia figuring as, as something, uh, you know, if not a counterweight, at least a factor out there that has been uh, picked up in the presidential campaigns. And then actually the campaigns themselves and, and looking ahead to the new president. Uh, and when she assumes office, you know, does the... Uh, uh, it, well, it would be very valuable reading for both candidates. You know, how uh, how do we move uh, away from the concerns that have been raised about uh, alliance viability relative to the cost of maintaining forces mm -hmm. uh, or people going it alone? Uh, some of the campaign language language that has been thrown out and and that has been very worrying to some of our allies. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. You know, I think uh, there are a couple of things. The first is that. Um, the um, uh, 
there's a value to the alliance system in Asia for the United States uh, that goes beyond simply the security benefits, right? I mean, these are very unique alliances if we think about So I've been studying alliances my whole academic career. These are very unique alliances in the history of, of alliances and alliance theory in the sense that um, these were alliances that were largely created um, almost solely for security purposes, but the non-security benefits of these alliances over the years, um, is, it's hard to put a value on it, but it's one of those things that if it's gone, we would notice very much that, they, that it was gone. Just take Korea as an example. I, I mean, the United States helps to defend Korea, uh, but when the Obama administration wanted to create this new concept of a G20, a group of countries to deal with the financial crisis because the G8 was not enough. Um, Korea was one of the first supporters and hosted one of the first G20 summits. On climate change, you know, again, Korea was one of the one of the um, biggest supporters of climate change. The nuclear security summit, the, the President Obama set up a new regime for the safe operation of nuclear reactors and the safety of nuclear materials, a regime that had not existed before. Um, South Korea, one of the uh, most um, uh, one of the rising uh, both consumers and producers of civilian nuclear energy, they were willing to host uh, the nuclear security summit. So there are many benefits that are not directly related to security that these alliances, and that's just Korea. That's not even talking about Japan, Australia, or the other ones mm. that 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 um, uh, are beneficial to the United States. And you know, statements that talk about how allies are not doing enough are really not looking at the full ledger, uh, I, I think. Um, um, when we look, I mean, I think you're right that as looking forward, um, the, the next administration is going to potentially be dealing with a lot of change in Asia. Um, you know, the North Korea situation is obviously going to get worse. There's no indication it's going to get better. Um, you have you know, domestic politics in places like the Philippines that look like they're really changing the texture of the alliance relationship. Um, <clears throat> you have Russia that is very interested in trying to seek some sort of reconciliation with Japan. Um, and I would not put that out of the realm of possibility that uh, Prime Minister Abe, who's been um, trying to blaze new trails in all sorts of directions, might finally try to seek to end World War II with Russia uh, over these territories. Um, um, and so there are all these different pieces now in Asia that look like they might be uh, moving or in flux. I mean, with regard to the Philippines, just because it's the thing most um, that seems to be changing the most right now, you know, I, I think that um, uh, the next president just uh, needs to be patient, right? Um, uh, should not take the bait mm -hmm. in terms of comments that the new Philippine leader is making uh, and really focus on thinking about, well, okay, there's a, in any alliance relationship when domestic politics changes, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of, there's a lot of noise in the relationship that's in the headlines. But you know, what are our core equities in the relationship and are those things being eroded? Right? And in the Philippines case, I think it's clearly the legal framework agreement that had just been negotiated on base access. If um, the Philippine leader is, is seriously focused on eroding that or nullifying that, then that's a, that's a completely different situation. But, um, but taking the bait in terms of all the name calling and all that, I don't think that's, that's uh, something that, uh, that the United States should get involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you place the context of the alliance system relative to China's rise? So uh, I talk about in the last chapter of the book, I talk about how um, the bilateral alliance system is the most, you know, it has left the deepest imprint on Asia as a region. Uh, but we have seen three waves of institutions in Asia since then. Uh, after the end of the Cold War, we've seen the sort of plurilateralization of this bilateral alliance network. So what that means is not U.S., Japan, not U.S., Korea, but U.S., Japan, Korea, right? U.S., Japan, Australia. Trilaterals, quadrilaterals, largely organized around functional issues, 
right? So like the six party talks was organized around a functional issue, right? Uh, the core group, US, Japan, India, Australia, was organized around um, disaster response, right? So these, this, this, these uh, triangles, quadrilaterals. Um, uh, the next wave really came um, uh, uh, after the Asian financial crisis in 1997-98, where we saw the growth of more regional institutions, um, largely initiated by the region, ASEAN countries, Japan, Australia, uh, things like ASEAN Plus Three, ASEAN Regional Forum, Chiang Mai Initiative, you know, a whole host of institutions that grew out indigenously as a result of the financial crisis. And then what we've seen in the last decade are the China-based institutions. Um, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, SICA, RCEP, right? Uh, a real aggressive effort by China to create a new set of institutions. Um, and so I think what a lot of scholars have talked about in terms of this is there's a competition taking place now uh, among institutions in Asia. Um, um, uh, academics, some academics talk, call it institutional balancing that's taking place, balance of power, institutional balancing between the US-based system and the China-based system. And, um, I, and so, so there isn't a right answer here. I, mm -hmm. my, my view on this is that I think there are uh, uh, all sorts of institutions growing in Asia, but I don't see them necessarily locked in a zero-sum competition. Mm -hmm. For uh, uh, there's no hierarchy clearly here in terms of these institutions, um, and they're quite complex. Uh, some of them run parallel to each other. Some of them overlap in terms of membership and mission. Uh, some of them partially overlap, um, and so that is the messiness of Asia's architecture. You know, it's sometimes referred to as the noodle bowl, right? Uh, in Europe, it's the alphabet soup. In Asia, it's the noodle bowl of Asia's regional institutions. Um, but I don't think we should expect or hope that they're going to evolve into something neat and hierarchical. Mm -hmm. uh, just because um, uh, Asia is in such flux that um, to try to create a hierarchy of these institutions um, would create more problems than mm -hmm. it would solve, I think. Yeah. in terms of insecurities and uh, power competition, membership exclusion, these sorts of things. And so um, I really see this as um, offering countries in the region a multitude of choices mm -hmm. uh, when you have all these different institutions. And uh, these institutions are also good because they, in the words of uh, academic Evelyn Goh, they enmesh the great powers Right, in both the United States and China, in these institutions, so that they have to abide by the rules of those institutions, mm -hmm. and 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 so I think that's that's very important too. So, I end the book with actually a more a positive outlook on institutions in Asia than probably most other people uh, believe. So. Right, and and I'd like to turn to the audience, but mm -hmm. I'd like to entertain just one final thought, mm -hmm. and, and that's you know what you just said so eloquently about institutions and where we find ourselves, and going back full circle to your first response, uh, where you talked not only about structure but also about the personalities, the drive, uh, the creative diplomacy at play. That was one of the takeaways I had, which which I found most moving, and why I think your book really is so relevant for today. Uh, this was a period, as you pointed out, of such unique transition. And one can't help feel that we're not at a period now, uh, enough time has passed since the end of the Cold War, enough questions have arisen about the disposition of powers now. Uh, and uh, though a personal opinion, you know, the lack of creative diplomacy, whether it's in our dealings with China or Russia, uh, or others, a need to re-up our, our alliances uh, for the good reasons, to modernize them, to, mm -hmm. to make them uh, uh, more fraternal, to sink. Uh, I saw great opportunity, uh, and I think the fact that you uh, present us uh, with the minds uh, that helped guide us uh, is an invitation, really, for uh, the current uh, a group of policymakers to think creatively mm -hmm. and to move us in new directions, uh, because this period has been important but I wonder if we're not off into a new period and a departure.
Yeah, I mean, I think we are. We are in a new period. I mean, when I think about the difference between then and now, uh, uh, you know, back then there was, I mean, it, as I said, it was truly a blank slate. I mean, we were talking about the aftermath of not just the World War, but the aftermath of decolonization um, uh, and at a time of unprecedented U.S. power. Mm -hmm. right? Just unprecedented U.S. power. Um, um, and today, I think we're talk we're talking about a situation where um, these these alliances that we have built over the past sixty or seventy years um, are at a point now where they become very important to complementing and supplementing U.S. power. Mm -hmm. They were an outgrowth of U.S. power at the beginning of the Cold War. They were a manifestation of U.S. power. But now um, they and um, the, all the equities that we have built in these alliances become very important at a time when there's still a demand for U.S. sustained leadership in Asia, and we don't have the resources that we did in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have the power that we did in the past, uh, certainly compared to the end of World War II. And so these alliances uh, become very important in terms of complementing and supplementing um, um, American power and its sustained leadership in Asia. Um, you can't lead if no one follows, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, in Asia, um, at the beginning of the, the, there were countries that followed, but now they're partners. Mm -hmm. right? Now they are partners, and they're partners in sustained U.S. leadership. Um, every country in the region understands that China will be a dominant power in Asia within their lifetime, but less than a majority in every single country, including China, is comfortable with China being the dominant power in Asia mm -hmm. in their lifetime. And so that is a clarion call for continued U.S. leadership and guidance, um, but we really need our alliances to do that. Yeah, well, thank you, Victor, and I'd like to encourage you all to uh, not only invest your time in this really very interesting and, and motivating book, but also to look online at the koreasociety.org. We have several pieces that have been authored by our president, Tom Byrne, uh, that have appeared in terms of support for the U.S. ROK Alliance, especially set within this campaign season. A new piece out in Huffington Post today, uh, one that was out a bit earlier, uh, and then also a letter uh, that appeared in the Washington Post. Uh, and they dovetail very nicely with some of Victor's observations. Uh, and then uh, lastly, please do refer back to a program we did on June 2nd with David Kong, who's a good friend of Victor's, and uh, David had some very specific thoughts on the evolution of the USROK Alliance that uh, go very nicely with what Victor has had to say today. And those are all available, again, up online at koreasociety.org. Uh, thank you all. Uh, please, uh, and thanks uh, uh, to Stephen for, for moderating. And we hope uh, you'll fill, fill out your evaluation forms. This is very important for us to, uh, to monitor and to evaluate our programs to, uh, to see that we're doing the right thing here. Um, you have, we you also have a gift for Victor. Uh, now, Victor Cha, who you know appears worldwide at prominent places, uh, probably receives his fair share of, of paperweights and, and <laughs> other things. But uh, Victor is a lover of the Yankees, as are several of us here. Uh, and in the spirit of Lou Gehrig, uh, a, a vintage <laughs> mitt sign uh, uh, from Kenwell. And uh, something you will never be presented elsewhere. That's right. Uh, but we thank you for coming back to the Korea Society. We hope to see you all November 3rd for Ralph Casa. And uh, please do see us at koreasociety.org. Join as a member. And again, if you could fill out those uh, surveys. But please purchase a book today, and Victor will stay and sign, and you'll have a nice chance to meet Victor Chubb. Again, thank you, Victor. Thank you. And thank you all.